In today's session, I will try to explain some details about the male gamete or the sperm. Basically, this is another haploid gamete that we are talking about. Earlier session was for discussing the details of female gamete. Now we will talk about the male gamete that is haploid gamete found in the males. Basically, this is much smaller in size than the female gamete. A male gamete, broadly if I have to show what it looks like, this is its broad outline. This will be around uh, 4 to 5 microns in size. The width will be about 2 to 3 microns and the length this much would be around 5 microns and this is almost 10 times this length almost 50 microns you can see the first part that you are having a look at this is called as the head piece next is the mid and this is the tail that ends into end piece. This is a broad outline as I said. Now let's have, an, have a look at detailed structure of this part. Just keep in mind the sperm that we are discussing here, it's the human sperm, a mammalian sperm that we are talking about. This is the headpiece. Midpiece. The tail much longer so let's discuss it from here this is continuation of the tail and here is the end piece now here at the tip of the head piece there is a structure That is the acrosome or it is identified as acrosomal cap. Next to the acrosome contained in the headpiece It's a large haploid nucleus. Large haploid nucleus. So you can see the head piece is majorly occupied by the nucleus. Cytoplasm is negligible. Just around the nucleus it would be contained. Then this narrow part, actually we can identify this as the neck. Contained inside the neck is the proximal centriole. Tilts to the centriole would be at the end of the midpiece. In this region, these are the mitochondria. These are the mitochondria. And passing right through these and further is the axial filament. This, as I said, is the proximal. Centriole. 
this would be distal centrio and these are the mitochondria now here the mitochondrial uh, structure you may feel it to be slightly different from the normal mitochondria it's not like that if this is the actual filament in transverse section the mitochondria are arranged around it These are just ordinary mitochondria but they are arranged around the axial filament so the structure looks like this so head piece mid piece tail and the end piece head piece mid piece tail and the end piece that is how the parts can be identified now every part has a specific role to play in the process of fertilization that is actual fusion of two gametes what are those functions see main purpose of formation of this entire sperm is to let the male genes male chromosomes be carried to the place of fertilization that is to be released into the female gamete so that it transforms into a zygote so the main purpose of formation of this whole thing is to carry this nucleus the haploid nucleus rest of the parts they have their respective roles to play to begin with acrosome now acrosome contains sperm lysin or it is also called as hyaluronidase its function is when the male gamete approaches the female gamete when the sperm approaches the egg cell or the oocyte contains of the lysin i mean the the acrosome the enzyme contained in the acrosome it helps it making a small dent in the covering of the egg cell so that the sperm can enter into it and participate in fertilization so this would actually help the sperm in entering the egg cell the oocyte the haploid nucleus main purpose as i said is to carry the male set of chromosomes the haploid set of chromosomes the centrioles the proximal and distal centrioles they would be responsible for the mitotic divisions of the zygote as you all must be aware there is something called as astral spindle formation in the mitotic division that astral spindle formation requires presence of centrioles these are the ones which will be released into the egg cell so that it may get transformed into zygote and start undergoing mitotic divisions mm -hmm. so that's the purpose of centrioles mitochondria are meant for generating energy see it's the motile gamete that we are talking about so it has to be able to move and that movement requires large amount of energy which is generated by oxidative breakdown undertaken by these mitochondria oxidative breakdown of a suitable source of energy either a carbohydrate or maybe a fat so that is why mitochondria are provided here axial filament actually this is nothing but the simple flagellum that we know about it's a long flagellum that is seen here which will continue down as the end piece this is the one which enables the sperm to move around why does it need to move around because the place of release of sperm and the place of fertilization are different so this has to move from the place of release till the place of fertilization which is possible because of the movement of the actual filament or the flagellum so the mobility of the sperm the capacity to move is because of the actual filament or let's say end piece and the tail so every part 
as a seed has a specific function, a specific role to play. Now that's about typical structure of the sperm. But when we talk about the animal kingdom, it's not necessary that all these parts would be just as you are seeing them here. There is a possibility of a remarkable variation in morphology and structure. Let's come to understand that. This is the typical sperm that we have already seen, that we have already learned about. In the case of Ascaris, this is what the sperm looks like. So here is the sperm as seen in Ascaris. So it doesn't have a tail, it doesn't have a midpiece, just a small cellular structure. In the case of a few crustaceans, Either this kind of a thing or maybe just similar to an egg cell. This is possible in case of a few crustaceans, that is arthropods. Uh, in the case of amphioxus, this headpiece would be more or less rounded, spherical. This would be kind of midpiece and then a long tail. This is what is seen in Amphioxus, a cephalopodic. Then in the case of domestic fowl, very long headpiece, short midpiece and again a long tail. This is domestic fowl. In the case of rat, In the case of rat, the headpiece is bent, curved. A short midpiece, tail and endpiece. This is what you see in the case of rat, one of the mammals. Human being we already seen. Then in the case of frog, Head pieces slightly elongated, a short mid piece, end piece, or tip. This is frog. There is a kind of salamander in which, see, this is the head piece, a short mid piece, and a tail, which is something like this. A kind of salamander. Unique features are seen in uh, some of the fishes wherein there is a short headpiece, this will be a chromosome, either a single flagellum like thing or headpiece short mid piece and two flagella. This could be seen in a few fishes. Whereas in the case of flatworms, the head pieces almost pointed like this, a short mid piece and two flagella. This is found in this will be of course a chromosomal cap also over here. This is found in flatworms. So there's a remarkable variation in the morphological structures of these sperms in the animal kingdom as I just mentioned. Now fusion of the sperm with the oocyte or the egg cell is what is called as fertilization. But that's not all. Just fusion doesn't help. 
after fusion, the male nucleus has to unite with the female nucleus. Female pronucleus and male pronucleus, they have to fuse together. That is called a syn carrier. Carry on means nucleus, syn means fusion. So fusion of the nuclei have to happen so that the egg cell is transformed into a zygote and then it starts undergoing division, mitotic divisions. Mitotic divisions of the fertilized egg cell or the zygote are called as cleavages. Cleavage refers to mitotic divisions of the fertilized egg cell or the zygote. Now we have seen the types of egg cells on the basis of the yolk cell, yolk that they contain or on the basis of distribution of the yolk which is contained in them. That amount of yolk and its distribution would be playing a key role in the process of cleavage. How do we justify that? Suppose if this is any egg cell and it contains maybe a large amount of yolk. This is all yolk. So the nucleus and the cytoplasm is mainly contained here. If that is the thing, now what happens here? Part of the egg cell which contains nucleus and the cytoplasm it's named as animal pole or animal hemisphere and the other half which contains yolk predominantly it's called as vegetal pole or vegetal hemisphere okay this is how the uh, megalacetal or macrolacetal egg can be shown amount of yolk may still be more than what we are seeing here now what happens here if see this is a fertilized egg or a zygote then the cleavage see like any typical mitotic division here also there will be two main phases of the cell division karyokinesis or nuclear division followed by cytokinesis or cellular division so as far as nuclear division is concerned it would happen just as in any mitotic division but when we talk about this cytoplasmic division cellular division it starts as a furrow as a depression as an invagination that furrow suppose if we consider it this way see it's a sphere and the furrow is going through vertically. This is called as a meridional cleavage. Vertical. That meridional cleavage, this is the first cleavage. Second cleavage is perpendicular to the first one. What does that mean? It would be going in this manner. So this. This is one cleavage, this is another cleavage. They are perpendicular to one another, but both of them are meridional. Both of them are meridional. Whereas the third cleavage, it is latitudinal. What do I mean by that? It's going to be horizontal. This is the first cleavage, this is the second cleavage, and this would be the third plane of cleavage. So it would be now going in this manner. So there's a clear demarcation of cells in the animal pole and cells in the vegetal pole. That is where the point of differentiation is introduced. See, the cells which contain just cytoplasm and nucleus, that is cells in the animal pole, 
if furrow would be going through them just as any ordinary cell division. But when we talk about division of cells contained in the vegetal pool, the yolk contained in the cell, it's a fatty material as we've already learnt. So the yolk contained in these cells does not let the furrow pass through them easily. It takes slightly a longer time for the furrow to completely divide the cell into two halves. So what happens? The cells in the animal pole, they divide a bit faster than the cells in the vegetal pole. Resulting into daughter cells which are of dissimilar size. Cells in the upper half divide faster so they become smaller and smaller in size. Cells in the lower half they divide little later, little slower. So these cells remain little larger in size. That means it's a cleavage wherein dissimilar sized cells are being produced. Whereas if we talk about a cell which contains either no yolk or very little amount of yolk, that is illicital eggs as seen in human beings. The furrow, the first furrow, the second furrow, the third furrow, so on. They would be every time dividing the cells into equal halves. The daughter cells would be of the same size. Okay. Something more. If see we talk about a cell that contains a large amount of yolk. This is called yolk. This is nucleus and cytoplasm. Then it may happen that the furrow may not pass through yolk. It will divide the cells only in this half. Now that is how we classify them. How do we name them? If the furrow is completely dividing the cell into two daughter cells every time, we name that as holoblastic cleavage. Holo means entire, blast means fission, entire fission, complete division, complete bifurcation of the daughter cells. That holoblastic cleavage here and here, it's different because here the daughter cells every time would be of the same size and shape. So it is holoblastic, equal cleavage, equal sized daughter cells are formed. Whereas here the cells are not similar, not equal. So it is holoblastic, unequal cleavage. This is unequal, example could be frog. This is equal, could be human beings. And if it is this kind of a cell, wherein the cells are not dividing completely, then we call that as meroblastic cleavage. Meroblastic cleavage. Mero means mere means a part. Only part of the cell is dividing, so it is meroblastic cleavage. Sometimes it's seen that the dividing cells they become kind of a disc located on the huge amount of yolk then that can be actually called as a discoidal cleavage. Discoidal cleavage. That means it could be holoblastic, equal, holoblastic, unequal, meroblastic or discoidal cleavage. These are types of cleavage. These are types of furrows that are being formed. These are types of cleavages based on the daughter cells that are formed at every mitotic division. Okay. So this way the zygote would undergo repeated mitotic divisions. Fine, so these are the three basic types of cleavages that we learned about. Uh, let's understand something more. See, after every cleavage, the daughter cells that are formed, they are called as Blastomeres. 
where other cellulose are part and blast means division. So these are parts from after division. So they are called as blastomeres. And from that point of view, holoblastic equal cleavage would refer to formation of equal similar blastomeres. Right. Holoblastic unequal cleavage would mean formation of unequal blastomeres. And as I mentioned, the cells in the animal pool, they divide a bit faster, leading to formation of larger number but smaller sized cells. So larger number of cells will be formed but they would be smaller in size. And they are then called as my Chromeres, that is blastomeres of relatively smaller size. And vegetal pole would contain cells that divide a bit slower. So less number of cells but larger sized cells will be formed. They are then called as megameres. As I said, this kind of cleavage is found in telolacetal egg cell after fertilization that is egg would contain yolk on one side and cytoplasm and nucleus on the other side so that would result into formation of i mean um, that will result into holoplastic unequal cleavage leading to development of micromeres and megameres while alicetal cells would generally result into holoplastic equal cleavage leading to formation of equal sized blastomeres Meroblastic cleavage will be formed in the cells or zygote that's formed by fertilization of centrolacetal egg cell. That is, this is the egg cell, this is the yolk. And after fertilization, when the cleavage starts, that cleavage would result into development of furrow only up to here. The furrow would not be able to pass through yolk. So, this is the furrow, this is the furrow, this is the furrow. So, there is part of this structure which is not dividing. That means it's an un incomplete division. It's an incomplete division. So, we call it as meroblastic cleavage found in centrolacetal egg cells after fertilization while discoidal cleavage will be found in myolacetal egg cells wherein large amount of yolk is contained rather egg cell is majorly uh, occupied by the yolk and little amount of cytoplasm and nucleus that too is pushed towards the periphery and in that case so this is the one that we are talking about, this is all yolk, cytoplasm is here. So only this part would undergo division and that is therefore called as discoidal cleavage. A disc like region would undergo cleavage, the rest of the cell is occupied by the yolk that does not divide, the furrow cannot divide it. That's called as discoidal cleavage. So these are the various types of cleavages in the early stages of development of embryo. Later stages of development we will talk about in the next session. So how do you like this video? Like it, subscribe to it, share amongst your friends and family and do not forget to post your queries, suggestions or comments. Thank you.